ladies and gentlemen, this is a course on modern Russian history from the beginning of this century to the present. It is a course about hope and about tragedy. The hope of successive Russian governments to uh, live in a better society, uh, even a utopian one from our perspective, uh, and the tragedy that has attended these visions. At the beginning of the century, Russia was an empire, a multinational empire presided over by a Christian Russian Orthodox Tsar. And it was the belief of this Tsar and of the imperial family uh, that Russian uh, rule was benign and that it could lead to comedy amongst the many peoples of the empire. Communism, of course, is about so, uh, social equality, about uh, the achievement of justice here and now on the earth, and uh, we know a good deal uh, about that uh, from reading histories of the middle of the century, both what it meant in theory and what it meant in practice. And now it seems to me Russia is in search of a new vision, uh, maybe a democratic vision, more likely a nationalist vision in which uh, some measure of Russia's former greatness would be restored. Those are the hopes. The tragedies uh, are known to us and unknown to us. Tragedy uh, of 1914 to 1917 uh, in, uh, ended the autocrat, Christian autocrat Nicholas II and his dynasty, 300-year-old dynasty. Um, communism meant bloodshed that was unparalleled in the course uh, of Russian history or indeed the history of any modern nation that I'm aware of. And even now, as we contemplate Russia searching for a new path, uh, already we can see uh, the outline, the shade, the limbs of tragedy in the war of, uh, in Chechnya and in uh, the internal disturbances that mark Russian society today. What are the themes? Those are the themes of our course and uh, now let me say something about the uh, objectives of the lectures. I want, in the first lectures of this course, to talk about Russian government as it was at the turn of the century. I want to talk about Russian politics, about contending ideologies and political parties, and most especially, I want to talk about communism, about the party organization, about the different visions that uh, communists manifested uh, in this pre-1917 period. Then we will spend a good deal of time talking about the communist experiment under Lenin and Stalin. Uh, and I will uh, devote a couple of lectures uh, to the war, uh, the Great War from 1941 to 45, which killed so many Soviet people, the attempts of the regime to reconstruct and reconstitute itself after this war. From 1953, to 1991, and arguably beyond 1991, uh, the Soviet Union experienced de-Stalinization. This is something that some historians think was finished in 1991. I think you could push the argument a little farther and say that even now, in post-communist Russia, efforts to de-Stalinize, to exercise Stalinist habits of mind uh, and Stalinist culture from the body politic are ongoing. And of course, at the end, I will devote several lectures to Mr. Gorbachev's Perestroika reforms and uh, to what we know of the Yeltsin government. This is a course about the Russians, but it is also a course about us. It is about uh, a stake, a historical stake that we have in understanding. Many of us, uh, uh, were born in the Cold War generation. Uh, all of the adults uh, in this room and in the listening audience know that America expended enormous amounts of capital, trillions of dollars in the efforts to defend ourselves against the real and perceived communist menace, to contain uh, the Soviet Union and to contain uh, the allies of, of the Soviet Union. 
Communism also had uh, a subtle and sometimes startling impact on American culture. We think only of the great African-American novelist Richard Wright, who in the 30s was a member of the Communist Party, and this was an experience that marked his uh, early fiction. So uh, from defense expenditure to our own culture, uh, this is a, a matter that we have an interest in, and it is one of the justifications of our course that in understanding uh, the Russians and Soviets, we will have a greater measure of self-understanding. Now let me turn to my topic for today. My topic for today is Nicholas II, the imperial government uh, at the turn of the century, and also uh, the social and ethnic difficulties that beset Russian society uh, in this period. Nicholas II came to the throne with the determination that he would rule Russia unwaveringly and unfalteringly in the spirit of his father Alexander II. He was, Nicholas was, a Christian autocrat. That is to say, he believed that his office came to him from God himself. And it was Nicholas' determination, like that of every autocrat before him, to pass this office and also the Russia that he inherited onto his heir full and uh, unchanged. Nicholas was aided in his religious beliefs and in his political determination by his wife, Alexandra. Alexandra was born a German princess in the house of Hessen. Uh, she was raised a Lutheran. In her house, there was a good deal of accent on charitable works and, of course, on the reading of the Bible. When Nicholas proposed to her, she had a very difficult decision because she could only marry Nicholas if and only if she converted uh, to Russian Orthodoxy. What was it that ultimately sold her on Orthodoxy? It's clear it wasn't uh, the amatory uh, prowess of Nicholas himself. It was uh, elements of the Orthodox religion. She loved Orthodoxy because of its emotiveness. One could manifest emotions in the course of an Orthodox service uh, that would uh, not be shown in the rather staid Lutheran practice of her home. It was a mystical religion. There was a belief in uh, achieving salvation through suffering. Those of you who have read Dostoevsky's novels know that this is a central conceit of the heroes of these novels, but it is a conceit that is drawn out of the Russian Orthodox religious heritage. Um, so Alexandra, when she married Nicholas, when she converted to Orthodoxy, she converted to uh, a religion passionately with belief, and with such passion and belief that she reinforced uh, the political uh, and religious understandings of her husband. And if you read their correspondence, it is simply full of this, uh, of religious uh, uh, expressions uh, and affection that is rooted in a common belief system. Now, Nicholas came to the throne with certain models of behavior, which he had learned in his youth uh, from the courtiers that taught him. And uh, based on his own wide reading in Russian history, he was a Russian history buff, uh, he chose two Russian czars of the past to model his reign on. The first of these was the 17th century czar Alexei Mikhailovich. He was a man so saintly, so devoted to orthodoxy, that Russians of his day referred to him as Alexei Tishaishi, Alexei Most Gentle. The other autocrat, which Nicholas admired a great deal, had a spirit far different from that of uh, 
Alexei Most Gentle, and that is the uh, autocrat Ivan IV, uh, known usually in English as Ivan the Dread or Ivan the Terrible. This was a man uh, who was ferocious in defense of Christian learning and a man ferocious uh, to his political enemies. In fact, uh, he is a Russian czar, uh, one uh, among several, who uh, slayed his own son uh, out of a political disagreement. So Nicholas chose two models for his reign that couldn't be more different. One gentle, one ferocious, and the two models help to explain certain actions at different moments, moments of his reign. Nicholas, for example, when he abdicated the throne, was able to do so with utter equanimity. This is something that was drawn from his uh, emulation, I think, of the saintly Alexei. On the other hand, Nicholas was known to some of his critics as Nicholas the Bloody. Uh, he committed Russia twice to great wars, and so uh, this moniker was perhaps very well earned. Behind Nicholas and Alexander, there stood the authority of the Russian Code of Laws. Article 1 of the Russian Code of Laws specified that, quote, the czar of all the Russias is an autocratic and absolute monarch. God himself commands us to obey the czar's supreme authority, not from fear alone, but as a point of conscience. Two additional articles of the Code of Laws, Articles 246 and 248, made it a criminal offense to utter, quote, impertinent remarks about the czar or about anyone in the royal family. These impertinent remarks were classified by the Code of Laws as blasphemies, that is to say, as religious offenses. So behind the uh, perception of the czar that his office rested on sacred authority was a legal writ which said that criticism of his majesty was in fact a religious offense. Now outwardly, many Russians manifested to the very end of the old regime, they manifested toward the czar an extraordinary deference by modern standards, by Western standards. For example, peasant petitioners who referred to the czar in their requests that uh, some grievance be addressed referred to his majesty Nati, the Russian word meaning thou. And this was the same form of address that was typically used uh, by Christians in addressing God in prayer. So the religious deference toward the autocrat and religious deference toward God was one and the same for these common Russians. As late as 1914, the day that Russia's commitment uh, to fight in the uh, World War against uh, Germany and Austria was announced, Nicholas appeared uh, from the balcony of his winter palace on Palace Square and assembled Russians below him, knelt and sang the national anthem, God Preserve the Tsar. This is, by I think our standards, an extraordinary amount of deference. Now, of course, any polity, any polity, has to have mechanisms to control crime, because there will be offenses, of course, and mechanisms to resolve disagreements among citizens. And in an empire as large as Russia, uh, one can imagine the multiplicity of disagreements that there must have been. The imperial government dealt with crime in a number of ways. It relied first and foremost for uh, the adjudication of petty offenses, what we would call misdemeanors, on peasant courts, courts of the common people established in villages based on uh, communal structures, uh, these would take accusations of crime and would deal out punishment uh, without recourse to a more formal uh, system of courts. Serious offenses, what we would call felonious offenses, uh, 
were dealt with through uh, a very complex system of jurisprudence. Now, people who are new to the study of Russia might not know, but after 1864, uh, it was the right of every citizen accused of a criminal offense to have a jury trial in Russia. And in theory, the judges that presided over this jury trial were life appointees. They were irremovable from office, and so the executive, in theory anyway, couldn't uh, impact on their uh, position by threatening to fire them. In the large cities, there was a legal structure that in some respects resembles our own. For example, workers who were accused of crime in the big cities of the empire, St. Petersburg, Moscow, Kiev, could plead poverty and they would be provided free of charge by the local bar association an attorney who would represent them in court. Now, this was something that was not mandated by any kind of a Russian constitution because such a constitution uh, didn't, didn't exist at this point. But it was something that in practice uh, from the 1890s on was available uh, to, pe to uh, peasant and to uh, worker defendants. Now, more and more frequently after the turn of the century, both in the countryside and in the city, there were serious disputes. Disputes between the peasantry and the nobility in the countryside. Disputes between workers and factory owners in the cities. In the countryside, disagreements between peasants and noble landowners sometimes resulted in collective protest by the peasants. And these protests took various forms. Sometimes uh, a form analogous to the industrial strike peasants simply refused to work uh, uh, as they were instructed to do by a contract that they had pr previously signed. Uh, they didn't bring in the grain on time on, on uh, a noble's estate, something like, like that. And of course, this has very serious economic consequences for the nobility. In other cases, in 1902, 1903, in the southern part of the empire, uh, in the provinces of Kharkov and Poltava, uh, which are part of southern Ukraine, there were more serious manifestations of peasant grievances. Uh, on 50 or so estates in that region, uh, landowners were burned out at the turn of the century. Many others felt that for the safety of themselves and their families, they had to flee. And in 1905, 1906, there was a wave of peasant violence, some of it uh, uh, resulting in the killing, the actual killing uh, of landowners. Uh, this was a part of the revolution of 1905 to 1907. So very serious disputes could happen in the countryside. And in the cities, uh, with the turn of the century and in a rising crescendo up until 1906, there was a wave of strikes, many of them political strikes. Uh, the most, uh, the best known example is the strike, the general strike uh, in St. Petersburg, I suppose, in, in the 1905 revolution. But even before then, 1904, an Orthodox priest by the name of Father Gapon led uh, a group of peasants and workers from various parts of the capital to the center of town in the attempt to present a petition to the Tsar. And these streams of workers, led by Gapon and others, uh, as they approached the palace square, were blocked by police. The few that reached the palace square uh, had the unfortunate experience of being fired upon by soldiers on the 9th of January, 1905. This was a terrible incident known in Russian history as Bloody Sunday. So the potential for social antagonism, very serious social antagonism, was always there. How did the Tsar and his regime deal with this potentiality? Well, in order to diffuse cases of potential violence, the regime 
appointed provisional, pr provincial governors. These were people who were very savvy bureaucrats. They are sometimes pr portrayed in historical literature as heavy-handed, but in fact, the best historian of these provincial governors, a man called Richard Robbins from New Mexico, has pointed out that they frequently used charm. He, he refers to their politesse, their ability to confront even an angry crowd and to somehow, by blandishments, diffuse uh, the angry sentiments of the crowds. Of course, as I have already intimated, this kind of attempt to charm potential uh, uh, protesters uh, out of acts of violence did not always work. And in these cases, the Russian government had an, in its arsenal a variety of means to deal with protest. Let me just briefly outline some of them. In all of the big cities, Warsaw, Odessa, Kiev, St. Petersburg, Moscow, there existed from 1881 on a state of martial law. That is to say that the governor of the city, the municipal govern governor, had police powers that could be exercised against citizens who were even suspected of being revolutionaries or subversive. Vladimir Ilyich Lenin, who of course is a very partisan man in these matters, said that the emergency laws of 1881 were the real constitution of Russia all the way down to 1917. There is some truth in that because those emergency uh, laws that mandated this kind of war condition in the big cities of the Russian Empire did remain in effect until 1917. The Russian government had police agencies of various types that it could use to uh, infiltrate revolutionary organizations that had the power to open mails, uh, the mails, uh, letters sent from Russian citizen to Russian citizen, the Department of Gendarmes, the Department of Police, and the so-called secret police or Akhrana were the three main agencies that I'm talking about here. Now, if all of these agencies failed to do their work, then the government could turn to its uh, ultimate uh, defense, defender, and that is the army. In the, uh, in the end, the army was the final guarantor of imperial stability. Now, we cannot leave the subject of the emperor's powers and the nature uh, of the internal regime in Russia without mentioning two additional quivers that were in the emperor's arsenal. The first of these was capital punishment. As in other states in Europe, Russian courts could impose a death penalty by hanging for capital offenses. And it did so when very serious crimes were committed. In 1825, for example, when the so-called Decembrists rebelled and attempt to, attempted to seize power in St. Petersburg, five of the leading rebel conspirators were hanged by the government. After 1881, when Tsar Alexander II uh, was assassinated by revolutionaries in broad daylight in the middle of St. Petersburg, there were another five hangings of the miscreants who were responsible for this terrible deed, including, incidentally, one woman. This was a shock uh, that a woman uh, would be hanged by the imperial regime, but Tsar Alexander III, the successor of the slain Alexander II, felt that he had no choice but to mete out this punishment to someone who had killed his father. Sometimes the government sentenced miscreants, subversives, revolutionaries to death, but at the very last minute, it dramatically commuted this death sentence. The most famous example of this uh, occurred in Dostoevsky's life in 1849. Dostoevsky was a member of the so-called Petrushevsky Circle, which is a group of 
socialists and uh, in some cases of would-be revolutionaries. Uh, the leaders of the Petrushevsky circle were arrested, they were sentenced to death, and they were actually brought to the Senate Square in the middle of Petersburg and told they would be hanged uh, before horses uh, arrived from the emperor dramatically uh, commuting this death sentence. Now, if we measure by the standards of the Soviet Union, 20th century standards, that's, let's say, in that part of the world, recourse to the death penalty under the czars was relatively infrequent. One authoritative source has calculated that between 1826 and 1925, less than 900 people were hanged in Russia. That is to say, about 11 people a year. During the bloody events of the 1905-1907 revolutions, the government employed capital punishment on a rather larger scale. Uh, if you take the first six months of 1906, when military tribunals were meeting out uh, immediate justice to revolutionaries, uh, there were 950 political offenders that were hanged in that, in that period. But still, I caution, by the standards of the mid-20th century in the Soviet Union, this was a small number uh, of people put to death. The second extra arrow in the government's arsenal was exile and hard labor in Siberia. Now, as prison sentences go, banishment to Siberia was not necessarily that severe a punishment. What it entailed usually was this, that a, uh, a, a person convicted of a political crime, those were usually the, the sorts of people banished, was confined to a given village or small region. Periodically, once a week or once a month, depending on how close the police constabulary was to that place, uh, the criminal would have to report his presence to the authorities. There are very many cases, famous cases, of revolutionaries banished to Siberia who managed to run away, some of them several times uh, running away. Uh, so this kind of punishment was not that severe. And incidentally, uh, when Vladimir Ilyich Lenin was banished to Siberia, uh, he managed to write a book uh, during his banishment uh, on the condition of labor. So uh, one could even work under these circumstances at intellectual tasks. Now prison labor camps uh, were a different matter. Most serious crimes of a political nature resulted in confinement in a hard labor camp. The worst, the most notorious of these hard labor camps uh, at the uh, turn of the century was on the Isle of Sakhalin. This is on uh, uh, the very, very far eastern part of, uh, of the then Russian Empire. Um, there, people were heavily manacled uh, so that they could not run away, and they were usually shaven, whether they were male or female, in such a manner as to identify them as politicals uh, so that if they attempted to run away, they would be easily caught and brought back. Anton Chekhov, the great physician, the writer, uh, say one that gave us the cherry orchard and Jaja Vanya, visited the Isle of Sakhalin in the 1890s, and he's left a very restrained in its tone, but also very harrowing account of what life was like for the political exiles at that place. So, in short, the Russian government was a religiously conservative government. It relied on the police and the army to suppress dissent. It used on occasion capital punishment, exile, and Siberian hard labor camps. And all of these factors probably explain the impression of some contemporaries, visitors to Russia, and some Russians themselves, that on the turn of the century, Russia was a kind of a monolithic state, an inert state, a Christian state that wouldn't change for a very long time. And yet, these impressions, as we'll see right now, were uh, illusory. They were mistaken. Beneath the 
placid exterior of Russia. Beneath the peasant caftans, the colorful blouses of the women's workers' garb in the city, there were seething resentments in people's souls. These resentments were uh, multitudinous, but if we want to classify them, it's a dangerous business for a historian or anyone else to sort out the nature of resentments because they're so complex and sometimes irrational. But if we want to categorize them, it seems to me, we can talk about two sorts of resentments. One was the kind of ethnic resentment that was felt by the non-Russian and particularly by the non-Slavic peoples of the empire toward the Russians. And the second kind of resentment, uh, I think, can be called the antagonisms that were created by the growth of the market economy from the late 1880s uh, through 1914. Let's focus for a minute on the first of these kinds of resentments. At the turn of the century, the Russian Empire was an enormous landmass. It comprehended the terrain stretching across two continents from Poland in Europe all the way to the Pacific, so it was a Euro-Asiatic territory. And in the north, from the Baltic and White Seas to the south and the Black and Caspian Seas. So this is a, an extraordinary amount of territory. And on this territory there lived, demographers tell us, somewhere between 125 and 130 million people at the turn of the century. Now of these, three quarters were Slavs. Russians, Poles, Belarusians, Ukrainians, and some smaller Slavic peoples. Less than half of them were Great Russians. To be more precise, uh, there were about 57 million Great Russians that made up 45% of the imperial population. Most of the Great Russians, the ethnic Great Russians, were concentrated in the central parts of the state, what I would like to call the core of the empire. And around this great Russian core of the empire were peoples that had generally been conquered by the Russians in uh, the uh, moments of their imperial expansion. If you look in the West, you find communities of other Slavic peoples, about 22 million Ukrainians, about 8 million Poles, roughly 6 million, million Belarusians at the turn of the century. But the West was also the home of over a million Germans, a million Baltic peoples, Estonians, Latvians, Lithuanians, about 5 million Jews lived in the area known as the Pale of Settlement in the Western provinces, so in the West, the ethnic great Russians were submerged, as it were, in a sea of other Slavs and also non-Slavs. If you look in the South, there were Greeks, there were Turks, Armenians and Georgians, Chechens, Ingusheti, Mingrelians, Ossetians, Tatars, Turkomans, and Uzbeks. In the eastern steppe, there were Kazakhs, Bashkirs, other small nomadic or semi-nomadic tribes. The eastern, uh, far eastern part of uh, the empire, what we call commonly Siberia, was home to dozens of indigenous peoples. And then in the north, there were the Finns. Finland was at this point nominally an independent state, but it was administered under the Russian crown. And there were Finnish minorities living in Russia outside of Finland. So nearly a hundred peoples constituted this multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious empire of Russia. Now, how to describe such 
a government in operation. One way to describe it uh, is as a friend of mine, another historian uh, did, he called it an improbable monstrosity, something that had just grown up willy-nilly by random. Other people, not so charitable, have caused it, called it the prison of nations. And there is some truth in this, because many of these peoples, if they had their preferences, would not have wanted to live under the authority of the Russian czars. Now, let us be fair. Some of the peoples in the empire found it in their calculated best interests to remain under the suzerainty of the Romanovs. This was probably true, for example, of some of the people in the Ukraine who were Russian Orthodox. It was probably true of the Belarusians. Uh, it was likely true of the Baltic Germans because they were very well treated in the imperial bureaucracy. They were, in a sense, a more favored people than even great uh, Russians themselves. It is probably true as well of Armenians because the alternative for the Armenians was too horrible to contemplate. That was namely living uh, under Turkish suzerainty. And one knows what happened uh, to the Armenians that lived there in the great genocidal killings uh, during the First World War. So, some of these smaller peoples certainly uh, appreciated and benefited from Russian rule. And yet, nevertheless, on the whole, there were grave difficulties besetting the administration of Russia in uh, the ethnic area. Let me give you a couple of examples. For example, Jews in the Pale of Settlement. It is well known that they were the subject of many discriminatory laws. After the 1890s, they could not be admitted to the Russian bar. There was a quota placed on Jews uh, as to the number of people that could get a higher education. Uh, in the 1890s, Nicholas II himself signed a law which said that Jewish citizens of the empire could not take Christian names. This has an eerie uh, resonance for people in the 20th century who know what happened in Nazi Germany. From time to time, there were terrible deeds that were attributed to the Jews. For example, in 1879, in a southern town called Kutaisi, a Jew was charged with ritual sacrifice of a Christian child. This was so-called uh, blood accusation that was conjured up uh, by local Russian nationalist Christian uh, anti-Semites. This was a charge repeated in 1911 in Kiev in the case of uh, Mendel Bailis a man who uh, was ultimately acquitted by the Russian courts because the evidence against him uh, was fabricated. There was violence directed by so-called Christians against the Jews. In 1881, in 1903, in 1905, Jews were victimized by Christians in so-called pogroms. These were episodes of violence which were, from the Christian point of view, organized. Christians marked into Jewish quarters of cities and uh, all sorts of mayhem resulted. So the Jewish population of the empire was filled with fear and a very understandable resentment against the Russians. Or take another flashpoint, this one to the north. I remember I mentioned before the Finns. Up until roughly the end of the 1880s, the Finns were satisfied that their nominal independence was being respected and their uh, domestic autonomy to make certain rules governing the Finnish population respected enough that they had no serious quarrel with the imperial regime. In fact, Alexander III was rather popular uh, in Finland. But under Nicholas II, after he appointed a governor named Bobrikov in Finland, all of this changed and changed for the worse. Uh, starting uh, in the mid-90s, there was uh, a series of attempts by Finnish uh, nationalists to reverse disagreeable policies that were put in place by Nicholas and by Governor Bobrikov. In 1899, this is something that is known uh, to Finnish 
uh, peoples and Finnish historians very well, but it's not very often mentioned, I think, by Russianists. In 1899, over half a million Finns, if you could imagine, signed an address uh, and took it to uh, Nicholas II, and the address accused the Tsar of trampling on Finland's historical rights and asked for redress to these grievances. Polish nationalism was a problem. I won't go into detail about that. Poland was uh, also nominally an independent state, but it was from the 80s on administered as a kind of province of the empire so that the difference between uh, the Polish case and the fin Finnish case diminishes as we get to the turn of the century. In Poland, Roman Dmowski attempted to organize uh, Polish peoples peaceably against the Russians and work for first autonomy of a greater nature and then eventual in independence. And the uh, man called Pilsudski uh, also organized, although his tactics were more violent uh, and uh, confrontative. So these flashpoints in the Pale of Settlement in Finland and Poland suggested that there were powerful tensions between the non-Russian peoples of the empire and uh, the Russians in the, great, in the core of the empire. Now a second problem that I will touch on here only briefly was the problem of social antagonism that was the result of rapid growth of capitalism. Before the middle of the 19th century, there was, of course, a good deal of commerce in Russia. But there wasn't a national grain market in rye and wheat and so on. It is only after the end of serfdom in 1861, and especially after the empire embarks on a very rapid set of uh, railroad construction projects that created the basis of the modern Russian rail network. It is only after the railroads and the emancipation of serfdom that peasants by and large experienced for the first time on their skin what it was like to live in a capitalist society. And in every capitalist order there are winners and there are losers, but the point that I would like to make here is that there were insecurities. People were unfamiliar with the market. They win in one day, they lose in the next, and they resent individuals to whom they attribute their losses. So these antagonisms powerfully surface by the end of the 19th century. Now in the cities, there is a situation that is comparable in a way to what happened uh, in Europe in the middle of the 19th century. If you think about the dark satanic mills uh, that uh, Charles Dickens describes in his great novels, this was the sort of thing that happened in the cities in St. Petersburg and Moscow and elsewhere. The peripheries of the cities were dotted by ever larger factories. Because Russia was a latecomer to capitalist developments, these ca these, these uh, 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 factories were of very large size. 5,000 or more workers were often working under the same roof. And this is politically significant because it was easier for these wor uh, workers to feel that they were commonly exploited, and it was easier for those who preached a different gospel than that of Nicholas II, namely a gospel of social justice, it was easier for them to reach this great mass of people who felt themselves to be impoverished. And thus the wave of peasant violence and uh, the wave of urban strikes that we have uh, talked about earlier. So Russia was a Christian empire. It had laws and institutions that were designed to preserve order, but these laws and institutions uh, were flawed, they did not preserve order, and indeed they could not. 